Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, so we'll just start with an overview of our agenda and some opening notes and reminders. And uh, after the reminders, we will go around and introduce ourselves. And um, then we're very fortunate to have a didactic on sleep, aging, and dementia by Dr. Lena Fine. And it's a vast topic. And I know that she has distilled for us today some essential nuggets. And then we also will have a wonderful case, um, well, practice dilemma or care challenge. Uh, or case presentation, we can decide as a community what languaging uh, we prefer uh, by Julie Holgado. Um, and there's lots of learnings there as well. So please rename yourself, your first and last name in your clinic. When you're not speaking, remember to put yourself on mute. Um, if you can turn your video on, it is a nice way to connect over space to see people's facial expression and smiles and engagement, but we get it if you can't. Uh, if there's more than one person, please list all the names of the folks in the room in the chat. Uh, it's with a heavy heart um, and also immense gratitude that uh, today we honor Alison Schreier, who has been with us since the very beginning of UW Project Echo Dementia when we met her um, in March, actually when we met her in like January or February, and then we got together. And I mean, it was kind of remarkable that we were able in the pandemic to stand this up. And it is absolutely true, Allison, that it would not have been possible to do that, uh, nor uh, would we have been able to create what we have created without your steadfast and creative and skillful um, and really supportive um, stewarding and uh, of, of Echo. And you've been such an integral part since the beginning and uh, yes, we want to acknowledge also everything that you're doing. So you're going on to um, be the CEO and you founded Zinnia TV, about which you've spoken here. So I invite everybody who may not have seen Allison's talks to go back and watch them. And even if you have seen them, consider watching them again. And she also received a Visionary Care Award uh, in the past and is a star um, on Wine, Women and Dementia, which is a documentary uh, by a care partner from Portland who cared for her mother. Um, she also is a Washington State DSHS Dementia and Mental Health instructor and um, is a Tipa Snow trained independent coach and consultant for positive approach to care. Uh, she's been our program manager here at UW Project ECHO for over three years now, and you are so much more. And so from the bottom of our hearts, we want to really thank you for everything, all your contributions, um, and we will very much miss you. And if everybody can unmute themselves and just say thank you to Allison, um, we can echo that to her in this moment. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. And of thank course, you. I need to say thank you to all of you. Uh, sorry, we're sitting, we're actually, we're sitting next to each other. I don't know. <laughs> and I know that Samantha- yeah, Thank you so much to all of you. And I'm just stoked that we have <laughs> Samantha coming in to yes. just um, very, very, very ably um, jump into the uh, driver's seat here. It's going to be a, a great ride. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And thank you. Yes, Samantha. I know, Samantha, we were- you were introduced last sesh and um, absolutely the, the baton has been passed and we're fortunate to have you as well. So um, thank you. Okay, moving on. So there are a number of other um, echoes that are offered through um, University of Washington for Washington state healthcare providers. So these are really for providers. And so there's the traumatic brain injury, behavioral health echo, on the um, 
first and third Fridays of each month. There's the UW Psychiatry and Addictions Echo on Thursdays. And then there's this um, telehealth behavior, telebehavioral health training series on the third Friday from 11 to 12, if you want to really up your echo game. And then there's this consultation line for people who have um, a lot of complex pain management, particularly high dose opioids. You see the number there, one eight four four five two zero pain, and then a CME accredited case conference series as well on tele um, pain. Just some reminders about PHI uh, during these sessions. We don't ever display or say anything that could reveal um, personal information about our uh, patients or their family members. Remember that each of the sessions are recorded and they're all available on our website. And um, it's a great resource uh, for those lectures and then also additional material, content, articles, um, patient facing materials that have been referenced during our talks. And then please also for, uh, fill out that post uh, session survey. It's just less than a minute. Um, next session reminder is November 17th, not the 10th because it's a holiday. So, uh, and Lynn Cordy, our own Lynn Cordy uh, is gonna update us um, on the state plan on the Dementia Action Collaborative and this from the Dementia Action Collaborative and um, long-term uh, aging areas on aging. She's gonna talk about the state plan and I will speak to you about our women's brain health program on uh, December 8th. So we have, just reminding everyone one echo only in November and December because of the holidays. Um, and then please do bring uh, your, whatever you wanna call them, your, whether it's a you know care challenge, whether it's a practice dilemma, whatever it is, you're a vital part of our learning and these care challenges can really help all of us to, to learn, take some time to be thoughtful together and, um, you know, use that collective wisdom, hopefully, to improve care. Uh, we have CME accreditation through the University of Washington for all of our sessions. If you watch, if you participate, unfortunately, we don't have that for asynchronous watching of the um, topic lecture, but they're still very useful. And then um, we have no, today's speaker has no financial relationships, uh, nothing to disclose, or if there were anything to disclose ever, it's been mitigated. And actually, in this case, it's been mitigated. Um, here's our hub team. Uh, you see with Samantha LaFontaine here as our new uh, program uh, coordinator, program manager. And we are all over the state and have given uh, many, many hours uh, since starting. And thankfully over 70% of the survey respondents say that they would implement a practice change based on the learnings. And we wanna keep building these sites. We wanna keep growing and growing and growing so we can um, provide dementia care throughout the state of Washington because there is such a need as we all know. So please bring your colleagues, other providers who could benefit from these programs. And actually we're gonna update this um, to reflect our new Samantha. Um, uh, let me go back one, sorry about that. So maybe I'll stop the share and we'll just go through a quick intro. Um, so I'll start, I'm um, Nancy Eisenberg and I'm a neurologist at Providence Swedish, uh, Samantha. Hi, I'm Samantha LaFontaine and I'm the program manager for Project Echo here at UW. Uh, the Project Echo Dementia, specifically. Thank you. Uh, Chris. And, uh, Chris Rhodes, neuropsychologist, associate professor of neurology at Memory and Brain Wellness here at UW, and co-lead of this wonderful project of cancer. Thank you. And Mimi. Uh, Mimi Patterson, hospice and palliative medicine for VMFH and member of the hub. Great. Trang. Hi, I'm Trang Lee. I'm a clinical pharmacist at Overlick uh, Hospital Senior Health Clinic. And Kristen. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. I'm Kristen Childress. I'm a nurse practitioner with the Manette Clinic in Bremerton and also an associate teaching professor in the School of Nursing at the UW. Great. And Julie. 
Hi, I'm Julie Holgado. I'm a geriatric nurse practitioner in Richland, Washington at the Catholic Senior Clinic. And I am also rounding at a skilled nursing facility, Richland Rehabilitation Center. And that's where the patient case study is coming today. So I will also have our social services director hop on with the case presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Julie and Kimmy. Hi, I'm Kimmy Demoto Riley, a neurologist at the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center. Thank you. Allison. Uh, Allison Schreier, outgoing program manager <laughs> for <laughs> this fabulous program. Uh, Christine Kempe. It's hard to hear you. Maybe we'll come back. Erica? Hi, I'm Erica Campbell. I'm a geriatric mental health counselor um, and the social services uh, care connector at Horizon House and a board uh, um, advisory board member uh, for the Memory Hub. Great, Christine? Not working, okay. Um, is it? Tace? Yes. Um, I guess. So Tace Merrick, nurse practitioner. I work for Ripple Care. It's a telehealth-based service. Great. Sylvia? Hi, I'm Sylvia Russo. I'm a neurologist in Spokane, Washington. I work for Providence for the Memory Clinic. And Anne? Hi, I'm Ann Chapin. I'm a PA with Peace Health Northwest, um, and I do consults for um, behavioral health for the primary care clinics, uh, including a lot of dementia patients. Thanks. Tiffany. Hi there, I'm Tiffany. I am the resident care manager at Richland Rehab with Julie Helgado, and I am the case manager for the patient she is going to be presenting on today. Thanks for being here um, with her. Jeff. Hi, Jeff Kaplan. I'm a family physician in Yakima. Janine? No, I'm a nurse practitioner with Providence Elder Place in Seattle, geriatric nurse practitioner. Thanks. Thanks. Lynn? Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Cordy with the Aging and Long-Term Support Administration, where I do program and policy development around dementia and work on the state Washington State Plan for Alzheimer's and the Dementia Action Collaborative. Nice to see you all. And Carrie? Hi, I'm Carrie Rubenstein. I'm a family physician and geriatrician at Swedish, where I also teach in the Family Medicine Residency and Geriatrics Fellowship. Super. And Lena, I'm just going to briefly introduce you. So as I said, we're super fortunate to have Dr. Lena Fine, and she's triple boarded in neurology, psychiatry, and sleep. And she is at Swedish, Providence Swedish, and he, she's here to talk to us today about sleep, aging, and dementia. Thank you so much, Lena, for being here today with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen and then I'll, um, let's see if it works the second time around. Great. Okay, no, it didn't work. That is now my Epic login. Let's try this again. Uh, okay. All right. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am a neuropsychiatrist psychiatrist and a sleep doc. And I'm honored to be here to talk a little bit about what happens to sleep with age and really what can we as clinicians do to help our patients uh, with sleep uh, without getting overly obsessed with this very important, but maybe sometimes over uh, neuroticized phenomenon of sleeping. Uh, I am going to speak continuously. Feel free to put in, um, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I might not see, if I don't see it in the chat long enough, simply unmute yourself and, you know, clear your throat and I'd be glad to answer questions. 
So I'm not just lecturing if we, you know, if I, if it's something I will come up with, if I decline to answer, I'll let you know, but please interrupt. So what I'd like to do is to have my, all right. First, I'd like to start today with just a few highlights about the purpose of sleep as it maybe pertains to patients, uh, to people as they age, as well as to our patients uh, specifically. So one of the big things that, of course, we are concerned about is memory consolidation and re uh, retention, which is one of the purposes of sleep. Uh, we know that during sleep, a uh, great deal of um, change occurs in the nervous system, pruning and development of dendritic spines. We've always thought that this is a phenomenon that we attribute only to young brains, but that we know that some, to some extent, uh, these processes continue through lifetime. And I wanted to highlight that a lot of that happens in different stages of sleep, but um, especially in REM sleep. And the reason it is important is that with age, technically our REM sleep shouldn't change much, but a lot of things such as medications or particular sleep schedules may affect this crucial stage of sleep that is essential for memory. And we want to try to preserve REM sleep, not to play favorites, but we want to preserve this stage of sleep as much as possible. And the question is, you know, whether uh, we know that, for example, in patients with schizophrenia, um, that one of the theories that implicated in development of psychosis is um, inappropriate pruning or under pruning um, that may lead to psychosis. And the question is whether we all struggle with patients who have dementia and potentially develop psychosis, whether that's also playing a role and whether sleep can be a, por a partial player in trying to mitigate psychosis, especially as in our patient population with dementia, as far as medications for psychosis, our hands are fairly tied due to all the side effects. So um, in addition to knowing about as one's coming. In addition to talking about the memory, we also uh, wanted to talk about the fact that glymphatic system, this phenomenally incredible lymphatics of the nervous system was discovered in 2015. And, you know, I, I'm sure that there are experts on glymphatics in this audience. So I, I will be cautious and hopefully knowledgeable enough to talk about it. But glymphatic system is is a, an equivalent of lymphatic system in the brain. It was discovered, as I said, in 2015. And just to kind of understand schematically, if you look in the picture on the right, the what one of the postulates, one of the postulated possible uh, mechanism is is that the glymphatic system in the perfect world can clear, you know, what uh, can can move um, the debris and particularly beta amyloid uh, smoothly through. Uh, and as we get older, that system becomes impaired. Now uh, in Alzheimer's disease, um, that, that system becomes so impaired that we're actually not able to move some of the beta amyloid out. Now, what is interesting, um, what is um, interesting is that we need uh, this recovery and repair and it happens only at night so, or during sleep. Uh, so glymphatic system works while the individual sleeps. One can argue that, that that's one of the reasons sleep has been so prominent and important in the preventative care of uh, for cognition that you, you know, by the, you can argue that it's sort of too late once you hit picture C in this, in this uh, diagram. However, it is still important for patients who already developed certain um, cognitive impairments to have sleep. Now, I'm just gonna add a curious little fact. You know, not only is that glymphatic system works when we sleep, position, there've been a couple of studies that show position of sleep is very important, meaning person who, who is not sleeping in a horizontal position may have 
an affected may have an abnormal lymphatic clearance. And this is very relevant, obviously, to patients with pulmonary conditions or people who have such severe sleep apnea and they don't get treated and they're sleeping in a recliner. So not only is it important for us to realize why people need sleep from the lymphatic standpoint, but even the position in which our patients sleep. So clearance and transport is, is crucial. And so that, um, that's, those are some of the uh, purposes of sleep that we uh, directly taking care of patients with dementia need to be aware of. And, you know, during period of sleep, we get um, energy conservation. We conserve some of the energy, especially for someone who is older and gets easily fatigued. So when you are looking at sleep in an older adult, there are some of the things you want to be thinking about, starting from the simplest one, the airway. I will touch a bit on sleep apnea today. Everyone knows about sleep apnea. I'm going to share with you a couple of uh, things that may or may not be self-evident about sleep apnea, but you always want to be thinking airway. How open is the individual's airway? Do they have sleep apnea, obstructive, central, and how it's impacting them? Movement is, is it's incredibly easy to diagnose restless leg syndromes. It's also incredibly easy to miss it. Periodic limb movements, PLMs, is restless legs while the individual is sleeping, as opposed to restless legs syndrome, which is when the patient is awake. So movements can be very disruptive. And the remarkable thing is that it's incredibly fixable. Neuropathy, not as easily, but restless legs and PLMs can be uh, fairly easily fixed, sometimes without medications and sometimes with medications. So when you're thinking of a patient who complains of poor sleep, you want to think of an airway, you want to think, how are they moving? Is that disrupting their sleep? Um, you know, how does anxiety, and I will touch on that a little bit in the context of insomnia, um, how does anxiety affect their sleep, obviously? And, you know, I've mentioned sort of treatments themselves, um, uh, whether, um, and I'll come back to a little bit, but for example, um, antidepressants in the category of SSRIs can actually cause restless leg syndrome. So if you're thinking, well, you know, my patient is anxious or, or depressed, I'm going to give them antidepressant, but that's actually antidepressant might inadvertently either activate the patient. Some antidepressants can be very activating, or it might actually worsen certain other symptoms like restless legs, which then in, inadvertently worsen the patient's sleep. Uh, metabolic, won't talk about it as much. Um, circadian patterns. Um, circadian patterns are genetic. They are mostly fixed through life. They do shift a little bit with age, and they're probably one of the secret tools that you can really um, weaponize when you're trying to help in an older individual, well, any age really individual to help with sleep. So what is their circadian pattern? Are they super morning people? Are they super night owls? And we'll come back to it, but it's helpful to keep it in mind. Lifestyle, of course, um, when do they eat? Uh, what do they eat? When do they eat? When do they exercise? When do they time their activities? Sometimes simple interventions like that may pr provide you with very fruitful information to allow, um, you know, allow for a change that may lead to better sleep. And of course, as I mentioned before, medications, you know, beta blockers can sometimes um, exacerbate nightmares. They can make people fatigued. Um, what are the, you know, antidepressants, um, you know, do statins, um, whether, you know, of course, you know, you only, you know, as a sleep doc, I'm always uh, looking at the flaws of statins, this miraculous drug, and yet so many people have um, spasms and restless legs. I realize that um, it's sampling bias for me in my specialty, but always trying to keep other medic uh, in mind other medications making the patient's sleep worse. I've put Nocturia as its own category. I'm by far not an expert in any way to on it, but if Nocturia is not addressed, then the people's, uh, people are miserable. So really thinking of it as a separate category can be life-changing. And as a side note, I just want to say Nocturia can come for many reasons, but as a sleep specialist, I can tell you that sleep apnea can exacerbate nocturia. So when you are talking and you're trying to convince an individual to get treatment for sleep apnea, nocturia and control of nocturia may be one of the reasons why a person may agree 
to the treatment. And then a little bit about sleep beliefs. And that comes on both ends. On one side, people have very rigid um, sleep beliefs about what the right sleep should be, should look like. When is a good time to fall asleep and when is a good time to wake up? There's a lot of sort of moral right and wrong around it. And then ironically, in the recent years, thanks to Matthew Walker, I guess he wasn't available for this lecture um, and his book, Why We Sleep. There's been such an awareness, and many other books, uh, such an awareness of importance of sleep that there's actually an extreme swing to the other, the other way. You know, the term now is orthosomnia. Some individuals are so obsessed with their sleep, that's actually backfiring. They're actually trying to spend a lot of time um, getting sleep. And ironically, the more you think about sleep, the more you try to get sleep, the more elusive it becomes. So keeping in mind, that sleep beliefs is something to address and um, in both directions. And we'll, again, we'll talk about it later. Uh, uh, these are among some of the things to consider when thinking about sleep in an older adult. Now, how much sleep does a, you know, a person need? This is kind of an up updated sleep foundations data. And you know, it's interesting, we think of the older adults needing um, less sleep, and it's a little bit true it's a little bit less but it's not that much less um you know they updated um the uk that massive biobank that they keep cutting and slicing and looking at the different ways um the latest update is not eight hours it's actually seven hours when they look at how much sleep does the individual need it falls now in about seven hours a lot of that data comes from looking at the correlations between uh sleep and uh um uh, ill health meaning at what um at what time duration does a patient appear to to be sick and that is, you know, when they when when a map that falls somewhere below six and above nine. So individuals who sleep fewer than six hours and more than nine hours tend to be sicker, and that means physically sicker or having mental health uh, issues. So the seven was sort of a kind of a seven to eight was the magical number between six and nine, and everyone, of course, is a little bit different. Uh, but that's where the, the the health data for how much sleep an individual needs coming from. Well, here's your special effect. Now, why is it doing that? So I want to, before we talk about how we fix sleep, um, some of you may be familiar, but this is how we look at sleep. So what are the stages of sleep? So, you know, if you think about we uh, when we sleep, we travel through the night through the cycles of sleep. So we start at cycle uh, you know, one, which is uh, stage one, which is very light sleep. We go into stage two, and then go to stage three, which is the baby sleep. This is a sleep where um, you, know, you can pick up, you know, in children, it's great. You can pick them up, you can carry them into another bedroom, they won't wake up. Unfortunately, with age, as I'm gonna show you, we lose some of that stage three sleep, but you know, different people to different degrees um and so we travel at night through these cycles we go stage one two three REM sleep and you can see REM sleep is close to wakefulness just because it's a very active sleep it's uh, it's sleep where we're metabolizing a lot of glucose you know if you look at the eeg it's a sawtooth pattern it almost looks like the individual is awake because the individual is dreaming so cycle two, we go back to three REM. And as the night progresses, what you see is that we lose stage three. That's normal. We kind of spend a lot of time in the working horse of sleep, stage two, and we increase the amount of REM sleep. And this is where if the person is um, waking up uh, too early, they actually might lose stage, um, stage REM. So REM sleep tends to happen in the second part of the night um, and stage three uh, tends to happen in the first part of the night. And just to break down, well, how much time is normal to spend in each stage? Roughly, as you can see, most of our night is spent in stage two. Um, stage three, that's a very optimistic 25%. You know, uh, it's not unusual for an older individual to get um, less, uh, get no stage three REM, uh, sorry, stage three non-REM sleep. And REM sleep is about 25% of our um, sleep. Um, so, and as we lose stage three, the sleep itself, the sleep architecture becomes looser. 
So then what happens? You've got the young um, young uh, child, you've got lots of stage three and a little bit of REM. Then you, uh, as you get uh, older, you start you start losing this um, stage three, this dip, and everything else seems to be okay. You start getting more awakenings. That's normal with age to become a little bit more fragmented. And then by uh, old age, your, your stage three sleep is almost gone. So when you have a patient, of course, they're waking up more often. They don't have that powerful restorative stage three sleep. Um, and they tend to their sleep. They tend to have more awakenings uh, with these peaks. And what you do notice, however, the amount of REM sleep is fairly stable through life. So even though stage three is gone, even though the sleep is more fragmented, how much REM you get is the same at most, most, most through most of your life. So um, to show this differently, um, sl slow, um, slow uh, stage three, slow wave sleep goes down uh, and may disappear. REM sleep slightly goes down, but generally stays the same. And this wake up after sleep onset, onset, basically an indication of how fragmented the sleep gets more significant with age. So you get more awakening. So that's what happens to sleep um, just in general, in a, even in a healthy individual. Now, in order to make an intervention, first, we need to understand weight. Individual at the, you know age 75 might have need for a little bit less sleep, but they still need the same amount of REM. Um, so we want to understand that. The next thing we want to understand is, well, what is the role of the circadian sleep-wake cycle in, sorry, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, in each individual uh, sleep pattern? So um, this is a wonderful schematic that shows that uh, why it is important to, to speak to patients at any age about the role of light in their lives, because this, this schematic shows you that when you're up here, you know, your computer screen is uh, shining light, the, the, or the window outside is shining light into your eyes, that light acts as an inhibitor on, uh, on your retina not to send the signals. It says, do not send signals, so to speak, it says, um, to suprachiasmatic nucleus, do not produce melatonin. Send signal to the hypothalamus, do not cool down the thermostat and start getting sleepy. Stay awake. Now, when the light in the environment dies out the night, that actually releases the break on the system that now says, now that sends a signal to through the suprachiasmatic nucleus to the pineal gland and says, all right, now start making melatonin. Now let's send a signal to the hypothalamus to cool down the body, a process that is rather slow. It takes several hours at night. So just telling, you know, patient says, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I go to bed, I turn off the lights. Well, it's a process that needs to happen over a period of time. So understanding the control of light and dark in one's environment. And by the way, nursing homes, it's particularly relevant because if you know that if that the light is going to keep someone awake, how often the, the, the shades are now are drawn, how often the lights are off. And then for people who we're going to talk about, you know, already have opacity of the lens and they don't get as strong of a signal, you, you're losing a very powerful stimulus, the light and the absence of light to try to regulate, regulate the sleep-wake cycle that may be weakening with age. So suprachiasmatic nucleus does become less sensitive because of the opacity of the lens. You just don't get enough, enough light. So you don't have a robust morning signal, you know, get, uh, get alert get the day started. Uh, you get an impairment in the expression of per persons for period uh, genes in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the sensitivity of the system to light actually decreases. So you want to have a lot more environmental intervention for people with age. And then you get a, a decreased activity of an MDA histamine um, histamine acts um, similarly to light in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the antihistamines that put people to sleep. Histamine is very activating. Antihistamines are 
putting people to sleep. So thinking about all of this, we really want to be mindful of what does it happen with age. And what happens with age is what we call advancing of the sleep phase. Super early to bed and super early to rise. So as the, you know, as the individual ages, as I said, the amount of REM sleep doesn't change. The need for sleep goes down just a tiny bit. But what really changes is the timing. The restaurant senior citizen special is exactly circadian response to the circadian phase. The advancing people really do get sleepy earlier in the night and then they become earlier risers. So it's very rare in my, you know, I only have one patient who came to me, she was seven in her seventies. She said, I am, you know, I've been going to bed at three in the morning, waking up at 11, no fun. All of my friends have already left for all the fun activities. I got to move this cycle. And it was so memorable because it was so rare. This is a schedule for a college student. So as one gets older, it becomes quite the opposite, early to bed, early to rise. And the reason it's important is that we need to be mindful of that in two dimensions, talking to patients of how to fix their sleep and also being aware when we may be missing the signal and losing sleep because the individual may be staying up too late. I will say it, and uh, if, if this, if you're not entirely clear, I will come back to this in a minute. So hold on, question if you have any questions. So melatonin, melatonin is not influenced by sleep. It's not influenced by someone getting sleepy. It's influenced by light and dark. It's influenced by circadian cycle. So it doesn't do anything to people who have fragmented sleep, or it does very little. It really just helps regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Look, um, on this little graph, you can see that it starts accumulating as the night sets in. It peaks around 12 or one, and then it um, ideally sort of dis almost disappears by the time the morning comes around. So if someone is struggling with trouble, with struggling with sleep, middle of the night, frequent awakenings, which is what happens with age, melatonin often is not a helpful solution because yes, um, bi biologically, endogenously, it is normal for melatonin to disappear. It doesn't work in the middle of the night. So it has a very robust activity in the biological night as opposed to social. This is less relevant to your patients, but you know, in people who work shift work, this is very challenging because they can be um, working nights only. It's very hard. One of the reasons is that it's hard to make melatonin um, production happen in naturally in the middle of the day. It tends to still happen. It's, it's weakened but it's still happening in the middle of the night, even for those who are shift workers in the middle of the night. And of course, with neurodegeneration, you've got loss of neurons in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. You got a major melatonin drop. Now you're starting to lose this excellent biological drive. And just, you know, a side note, it does uh, innervate the uh, 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 nuclei in the hypothalamus. It regulates energy homeostasis and pre-autonomic sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So it really, you know, starts playing with the autonomic function, especially relevant for patients who have have uh, autonomic function affected people with Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, and similar conditions. So with circadian rhythm, you know, what you get is a disruption of circadian clock. Um, and that actually affects what I started talking about. The purpose of sleep is to, re is to um, repair, to repair sort of synapses, not just to clear a glymphatic, glymphatically uh, beta amyloid, but to repair ability to form new dendrites. So for, for patients with neurodegenerative conditions, now we don't get that important function of sleep. 60% of Parkinson's patients have problems with sleep versus healthy control. And many of them have excessive dive sleep, daytime sleep and is attributable to very poor sleep quality. Some of it may be related to suprachiasmatic nucleus. Some of this may be related to irregular napping. As I said, suprachiasmatic nucleus is what you know, the, is exposed to light. Light keeps us awake. If you have damage to suprachiasmatic nucleus, plus you have an environment that is not conducive to alertness, then you've got two hits. Then you have a patient who is in, uh, napping through the day. Uh, they're already excessively tired because they have a condition, uh, but then that gets worse with this circadian 
dysregulation and lack of uh, exposure, but can be adjusted with environmental strong cues. And then, so we talked about circadian system, and then and the uh, the other force that gets dissipated by naps is this very excellent, wonderful sleep drive. It's regulated by adenosine. So the moment you wake up in the morning, you build up adenosine as a natural byproduct of ATP. ATP ases works and adenosine gets thrown off. This the more of it uh, you have in the system, the sleepier you get. It and it is influenced by sleep, meaning it's cleared out by sleep and caffeine and builds up when you don't have sleep. So as glycogen stores are used up, adenosine is built up, and then the more there is adenosine, the sleepier individual gets. The the faster they fall asleep. Um, it's a pressure to enter sleep. Now, here's a question. So if you are, if an individual is napping throughout the day, they are dispersing their adenosine and thus having um, trouble falling asleep at night or falling asleep at night and then not able to maintain this, this pressure of sleep and not able to continue sleeping as they have minimal amount of adenosine. Um, to contradict myself, not really, but to say, when your adenosine level, does it increase with age? There is maybe this is what's attributing to some of the excessive sleepiness that people with neurodegeneration have. One of the symptoms of um, neurodegeneration is excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue. And that may have to do with the uh, interruptions or disruptions of adenosine metabolism. You know, I made the sort of a hard choice not to talk about hypersomnia today, but I do want to emphasize that we want to get people to sleep healthy, but we also have to recognize that we're also dealing with significant amount of daytime sleepiness in our patients. And, you know, if you've got a newly diagnosed narcoleptic at age 67, don't believe it. Um, well, it could happen, but most likely you may one may be missing some sort of a neurodegenerative process, more likely than not. And then not, you know, so so while we are talking about sleep disruptions and trying to help our patients with sleep, I do want to emphasize that sometimes um, we, we also need to be dealing with hypersomnia, but that may be <laughs> um, a topic for another conversation. So adenosine, uh, get dissipated when, when the individual naps. So that is another reason that we can try to consolidate uh, patient sleep by minimizing naps. So I already touched on this, napping in nursing home, low light, both contribute to dissipation of sleep drive and loss of the circadian drive to go to sleep. So uh, in addition to these physiological processes, of course, there's also a psychological element to insomnia. I lose the, use this term loosely. I mean, I don't know if some patients with maybe dementia won't label it insomnia. Let's call it fragmented sleep. We have these predisposing factors. Everything that I've spoken about up till now is the predisposing factor. Circadian uh, degeneration of the particular areas like suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, um, Aden frequent napping, sort of uh, adenosine age is a predisposing factor in our population. And Arthur Spielman, who um, who I had the honor of training under, came up with this model decades ago. Uh, so you have predisposing factors, then you have something precipitating it. For example, the individual is moved into a nursing home or they're given a medication that they're struggling with. In a younger population, there may be some particular work stress or something happens. And that pushes people into, into insomnia or in trouble sleeping. And then as time goes on, as the person is trying to get sleep, they go to a doctor, they get a... Um, they get a medication or they are now have read everything online that's made them completely neurotic about their sleep. And they're trying very hard. They go to bed at eight. They spend 12 hours in bed, you know, an hour of rituals. Now you're actually perpetuating these troubles. So what I want to do now is to switch and say, well, what, how can we help? If someone comes to you and says, let's say you've taken care of all the physiological factors. And they say, you know, they don't have sleep apnea. They don't have restless legs. I mean, they have this very fragmented sleep. There are many different ways to look at uh, sleep in an older adult. 
And the first thing I'm going to say is remember, I said that individual who is older will have what we call advanced phase. So this is a schematic of different sleep um, uh, circadian rhythm and how they sort of fit. So the normal sleep, let's say an individual, I don't know what it says, 10 o'clock goes to bed, wakes up at eight. I don't know who, who has that kind of sleep, but let's say they have this sort of schedule. This is clearly, um, this is an old graphic, but it almost looked like post, you know, post COVID work from home kind of schedule. Um, the late sleep phase is the night owl, right? So someone who rarely goes to bed at three in the morning, wakes up at noon, they're shifted, they're delayed. And this is the group, this is the, this is what happens to people with age, they become advanced. So they tend to go to bed earlier, and they tend to wake up much earlier. Now here become, here, but here we can actually, it's important to get a good history because you have a patient comes to you and says, help me, I am waking up at two in the morning. I absolutely hate it, you've got to help me. Of course, your first question is when are you going to bed? And it's really, your job is made very easy if someone says, oh, I go to bed at 7 p.m., I'm dozing and I just go to sleep at seven. Well, that person just has advanced sleep phase. That's fantastic. You say, well, you know, what's wrong with sleeping from seven to two? Maybe they'll say, well, you know, socially that's wrong. I want to go out with my friends. I mean, there's a certain elements, but if you really think about sleep, there isn't one right time to sleep. And if you're here debating between giving someone a medication and, um, you know, recognizing their sleep phase, this may be completely normal. Someone may be going to bed at seven and they wake up at two. It may be a little bit annoying, but they're getting adequate amount of sleep. Now, your job is rendered more complicated if someone says, well, I go to bed at, uh, I don't know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock and I wake up at two. And maybe there is an issue we can work on, but maybe what they're doing is that they're sitting in front of the television, dozing from 7 p.m. on, and then they say, well, 10 o'clock is a good time to go to bed. I'm going to go to bed. And what's happening is they missed the three hours that they actually may have been sleeping. Psychologically, it's a weird thing to say to someone, oh, go to bed and you listen, you've been sleeping till since seven o'clock, but th that's actually what's happening. This may be, in again, in an older adult, a natural sleep-wake uh, cycle that they can be in. So you're about to give someone an Ambien or hopefully you won't, but when you may just be able to get them into a more natural advanced sleep phase so always try to think about like what is happening maybe they do need to just uh, advance the, the phase the other um possibility now another, another alternative is you've probably heard about uh biphasic or bimodal sleep pattern i'm sorry i've put in a bbc article i mean there are a lot of scholarly articles but um it's a really, if you're interested in this, there was a really fun BBC article. It's free. You can Google it about the forgotten medieval habit of two sleeps. If you, um, it's, a, it's rare that an article about sleep is a really, like really fun. So if you're a history buff, I highly recommend this one. Put it down at the bottom in the reference. Um, the notion of biphasic sleep is historically, there is a theory that humans might have slept in two stages. They slept when the night started, when it got dark. Then they woke up after several hours, had a period of quiet wakefulness, and then went back to sleep for another few hours. With um, And there are some, uh, there's actually pretty extensive historical data where that might, that was actually the case. And with uh, two big social changes, one is that the, the invention of cheap candles, um, as the upper classes started staying up longer, that pulled the entire sort of serving society of the, in the feudal world to stay up longer to serve the upper classes. And then, of course, with industrial uh, revolution, the sleep became even further compressed into one block. So. Whether that is what the patient feels or not, one one advantage is that in our population uh, with a with an older individual, they may be not con con confound by the need to go to work or to wake up in the morning necessarily. So there's often this expectation: I gotta you know go to sleep and have a continuous seven hours of sleep. However, for some people, if they have the liberty 
and they can mentally accept the idea of biphasic sleep. Sometimes that is the most benign solution. Sleep for three hours, wake up, you can read, you can, you know, um, iron the clothes, just don't forget to turn off the iron, and then uh, go back to sleep and sleep for another three and a half hours. Um, again, as I said, you know, often in sleep, it's not just about, it's, it's not just about the physiology, but also about uh, gently um, sort of challenging people's myths and expectations, and then making sure you have uh, a buy-in. Oh, I just see the chat. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, you want me to? All right, I will. I will speed through. Um, so, oh, sorry. All right, and then the last thing, um, and I'll, you know, uh, sleep restriction slash sleep compression. Um, you know, you sometimes want to. Um, uh, sometimes people are so eager to get better, they uh, they go to bed. Um, they um, um lying in bed for 12 hours, unable to fall asleep. And it is most radical thing to say, stop doing that. Can you please spend six hours in bed? Can you please go to bed at midnight and wake up at six? Uh, we call that sleep, well, I call it, technically it's called sleep restriction. That sounds like a very harsh term for a lot of people. Sleep compression is a gentler way, but sort of telling people stop. It's probably one of the most effective thing you can say, stop going to bed at nine o'clock, start, uh, you know, going to bed later. Um, uh, important tenants, you know, being obsessed. I mean, again, there's so much orthosomnia going on. People are sort of cataloging their fears. They're staying in bed forever. So uh, sleep compression is one of the most powerful things that the person who cannot sleep can do for fragmented sleep. Um, and um, if you don't, if, you know, if there's no buy-in, you know, call me and we can talk about it. But it is one of the most tested things and a, and a cornerstone of cognitive behavioral therapy. All right, I am going to whiz through, I promise I'll finish in a second. Obstructive sleep apnea, really, really important. Um, weight gain contributes, hormonal changes, sleep apnea. We know that patients with sleep apnea, the, the those who carry the APOE mutation, amyloid burden does increase if they have sleep apnea. Um, there's increased tau and p-tau um, in plasma and in CSF with patients with obstructive sleep apnea. We don't exactly know if it is the hypoxia or the sleep fragmentation or both that contribute to cognitive deficits. But what is really important to know, and I want to uh, you know, have this you know, come across, not all sleep apnea is horrible. So it is important that the apnea is severe. If you look here, we know that um, sleep apnea contributes to risk of stroke. But look, the patients who had more uh, likely to develop to, to have stroke had sleep apnea that wasn't wasn't a little bit. So apnea hypopnea index is normal if it's below five. Five fifty fifteen is mild sleep apnea. Look, these patients had moderate sleep apnea before it became clinically significant. So when you have a patient with sleep apnea, it is not a binary diagnosis. Having a mild sleep apnea is not the same for your patients with memory disorders as having severe sleep apnea. So your urgency with these patients should be also kind of modified. So, I mean, yes, I want them all treated, but mild sleep apnea hasn't really been shown to be as harmful to the brain as severe sleep apnea. Same thing, mortality increases with patients with severe. I would like you to really, really uh, remember that adjective is important. It's not all sleep apnea, but severe. Not to minimize the importance of it. Um, I want you to know that women who are postmenopausal are twice as likely to develop sleep apnea as women who are premenopausal. Even though we think of sleep apnea as being something of a men's syndrome, um, it is more common in postmenopausal women, uh, in women as they grow older. And the presentation is very different. Women are much more likely to complain of headaches than men. Men, it's always, it's maybe easier because they tend to be snorers. They tend to be sleepy. Women might have more of depressive features. They might be more anxious and they might have more headaches. Easy way to test it is stop bang. Um, we use that in the hospitals um, if you need a questionnaire. Now, many patients say, I don't want to go to the sleep lab. Home sleep testing is pervasive now. It is not as sensitive, but it's pretty good. 
85 to 91 percent sensitive so you can you know it may miss mild apnea but it can catch a lot of apnea so a lot of people can do this test in the comfort of their own home and uh, yes uh, sleep apnea can contribute to cognitive deficits and can the CPAP reverse those deficits uh, the answer is maybe uh, so there was mild improvement in cognition in patients on sleep apnea. What it can really improve is the individual's quality of life. Their daytime functioning, they will feel less fatigued. They'll be up for doing things. They'll be more alert. They may even have better mood. So you're improving the quality of life. We can't guarantee. And there have been some studies that show um, the, the paper earlier is, uh, this is the reference for the claim that there is a decrease in beta amyloid, but it definitely improves people's well-being, maybe delays MCI onset. So, um, so still a really good solution if sleep apnea is found. I will just plug in last thing before I before I finish RAM behavioral disorder. Um, RAM behavioral disorder often gets confused with nightmares. Uh, and what I want to say, if you have a patient who is asleep, kicking, thrashing, and then the partner wakes them up and they say, "Oh yeah, I was kicking and thrashing, and um, I was you know pushing away the dragon was attacking me." that is much more likely to be REM behavioral disorder than someone who it wakes up screaming, they, they're confused, they're disoriented, um, also in a younger patient. And um, then you wonder, does this patient have a nightmare disorder? They have significant history of a PTSD. Um, they're a lot less likely to give you a cohesive dream story um, as opposed to someone who has REM behavioral disorder. The other big thing is REM behavioral disorder tends to happen in the second half of the night because remember REM sleep tends to happen in the second half of the night and nightmares can happen in, but tend to happen earlier in the night, often actually coming out of non-REM sleep. And, you know, I don't have time to, to say anything more, but certainly be on the lookout in older people because they think there's something psychiatrically wrong with them. If they have dreams, I had one spouse tell me, why does he hate me so much? He hits me all the time. It's not psychiatric. It's not people out, you know, ask about it. There are treatments for it and improves quality of life. So that's my whirlwind review. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is my future office. This is in Dublin. I just took a picture <laughs> because I think this is perfect. This, this is going to be my office. I'm going to treat insomnia and then I'll give Sima and then I'll just have my office in the pure chemicals section. Thank so you so much, Lena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was, gosh, I mean, you covered so much in a short period of time. It was a whirlwind. I'm sure there are plenty of questions, but uh, we have a case. And so we'll just have to have you back and then the slides will be available. And then people can also watch the talk again, okay. because there's, it was just so rich. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I will now share my screen uh, and move to Julie Hogato's case. Thanks, Julie. And thank you, Lena, again. Okay. Julie, ready? Yes, thank you. And I have our social services director. This is Susan Elias. And she is um, very pertinent in this case because the questions will be geared towards um, the, the social aspect of her case. And medicine, I think, might be very helpful. But um, it's definitely a complicated case socially. So I'm seeing this 82 year old female patient at a rehabilitation center. She was admitted to the hospital with a fall and uh, treated for a pelvic fracture and UTI. And the fall was a mechanical fall at home on her stairs in the basement. She has an established history of frontotemporal dementia. I'm seeing a neurologist um, since 2008. She had a PET scan at that time, which was um, suggestive of frontal temporal dementia, which is where she got that distinguishing feature. Seizure disorder on, um, oh, you know, I didn't give you a medication list. Sorry about that. Uh, seizure disorder, she is treated. History of syncope, vertigo, anxiety, not on medications for anxiety, and asthma. She lives at home with a young male friend caregiver. He's not a licensed caregiver, but has had this um, relationship with her since 2021. 
two marriages and currently widowed, one daughter who lives on the East Coast, a never smoker, and she drinks a glass of wine daily with, it sounds like from some of the notes, some attempts to cut down past or recommendations the past to cut down. Um, retired seamstress, I didn't put it in, she's a she's like a long distance runner as well. And um, so she's uh, very proud of her fit body and presents to us with uh, concern that she is very, okay, so, her presentation is that her caregiver said that he's frustrated with her worsening dementia and wants her to get pain medication for her leg pain. However, the patient then asks to speak with me alone because she says she does not trust her caregiver. And she says, well, she doesn't trust her caregiver because he took away her keys. She does, he doesn't let her drive and he's making her stay in rehab. And she made some comments that he's never made sexual advances um, but she's also has this concern that she moves money out and she thinks he takes it. So there's a whole, there's a whole nother story. Then I, the next day, um, she, yeah, I'm going to all this. So I think the, the more we kind of delve into this problem of um, her behavioral, behavioral uh, statements, the more complicated it feels like it gets. Um, so we, we first thought on seeing her is that I, we need to establish a discharge plan for her safety. She has worsened dementia. She has a caregiver who's more like a friend, uh, housemate. And um, she has a daughter who has healthcare POVA, but who's also on the East Coast and has not been, has not seen her for 20 years, is not motivated to come, you know, to take over the situation. So we we have a trouble with establishing a decision maker. Yeah, let me move to the next slide. So yeah, our specific concerns are the her be her behaviors of her statements about her caregiver. Um we we kind of made a firm line that she's not going to drive with her seizure disorder and the dementia. We've told her that, oh, this is from the neurology note. Okay, so this is her neurology note from June. And so at the time, she was requiring assistance with multiple activities of daily living, which also weighs into her current state that she does require a lot of assistance. Um, so we can move to the next slide. This is also from the neurology note that um, she had normal labs, thyroid, MRI, the brain was done, um, no cardiovascular or ischemic disease. We can move to the next. And head CT. This is a PET scan from 2009, which was the earliest um, suggestion of dementia. However, it sounds like her progression was very slow because it's not, it's only been since about 2021 that she's started having mild changes. And then her daughter stated that it was in, yeah, about 2020, 2021, that she was just starting to really have these cognitive changes. You can, okay. Put the... Oh, this is also from the neurology note, the nightmares and she's on Kepra and then asking her to cut down on her wine consumption. Okay. Okay, so the update is the next day after I submitted the case, the next day I was asked by the nursing to evaluate her for statements of suicidal ideation. She says, I don't wanna be here, I don't wanna be alive. She has a family history of a father who committed, we think his father, and she said her, father committed suicide when he was diagnosed with a stroke in the past. She has no plan or intent to harm herself. Uh, but then later in the interview, she said that she wanted to do everything to get out of this place and wants to live. Uh, but she does want a half a glass of wine nightly. Um, despite her saying that she wants to do everything to get out and um, she's really not participating with therapy, bathing. Um, She's not, uh, appetite is not good. So appetite, bathing, therapy, and she's pretty, um, she pretty much is passive. Right, she's refusing meals. And she said she wants to be a certain weight. 
Yeah, yeah, and then and some would be I would say belligerent and mm -hmm. but, uh, very guarded to every staff yes. member. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of I think that's the update. The next slide might be our questions. Okay, so I think our main concern is when we come to our discharge recommendations, I can already see the writing on the wall that therapy and the team is likely going to recommend a kind of long-term placement dementia care. Her dementia scores, um, we don't have from therapy yet, but she's pretty moderately demented in the sense uh, um, oriented to self, but not always place and not oriented to date, time, or recent events, and um, cannot remember previous conversations. So she, and based on her neurology evaluation in June, she did need extensive care for caregiving at that time. And at this time, especially with poor participation, she's needing care for um, all, all ADLs. So with that being said, this uh, concern would be I'm anticipating that there's going to be a recommendation for kind of long-term care, dementia care, when she is ready to discharge, which I can anticipate that she's going to not want. And so we will be, I want to give Susan, you know, support on like, can the daughter who's healthcare PLA, but not seen the patient for 20 years, but willing to be like on these care conferences, if the daughter were to give a green light on placement to dementia care is that what are the legal steps or um, factors we should consider. I uh, also want to talk about her immediate safety. For me, the suicidal ideation is troublesome. I want to have a very concrete plan on um, the, how we document these statements, how we monitor her without, um, with, I think she's immediately safe, but I also want to make sure staff uh, have clear understanding of when they should notify and what they should document. And the question too is, is, is there any benefit to this half glass of wine daily? Because my feeling would that it could disrupt her sleep and put her risk for falls. And, um, and I don't believe that it would help her behaviors at all. So my gut is to say no to this request of a half a glass of wine asleep, but I'm open to if there's any thoughts of it being beneficial. And in medication wise, I've not started her on any um, antidepressants, analytics, or sleep aids. I've not heard that her sleep is disturbed. So I do think the medication might be a way to help her participate more. So my thought is to start her on um, an antidepressant or two. Sometimes I use Effexor and Remeron together, like Effexor in the morning to kind of get more energized than Remeron at night to kind of help sleep. And the they seem to work well together. So that's what I was thinking, but I just wanted to get a little more group insight on the, if someone had a better suggestion for the medication part of it to get participation up or if that's, so that's like the fourth question there. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And um, very complicated case. And I just want to say too, that, you know, with, with these um, care challenges or practice dilemmas, we have ample time to talk about it today and perhaps revisit it at our next um, echo session as well. And I saw that uh, Erica Campbell had her hand up. Hi, Julie. So um, question about the the um, discharge um, uh, discussion with the with the um, DPOA and um, the the young man that lives in the house. Has there ever been an APS call made? Um, yes. the, the daughter has said in the past, she's very frustrated in the past. She's made several APS calls that have produced no result is her feeling. So that might be um, something that you bring back in your discharge discussion is that if there's already been a history of APS calls, this is not um, this is not conducive to a safe discharge back to the community or back to home because mm -hmm. um, it's not uh, this does not bode well whether this young man is an upstanding young man and everything is copacetic with him. It does not put him in a good position if she's making accusations against him. 
Um, it's not a safe situation. Um, and um, it, it, uh, so, uh, so it's not, it's not good or healthy for him. And, and you should, you know, really spell him that it's not putting, it's not doing him any favors to have this repeat cycle for her, you know, to, to hang her out, to, to dry um, in this kind of fashion. Um, so it would be a better plan for, um, because this keeps, this has been a repeat cycle to say, you're not safe to be on your own because of this, this ongoing pattern in the community. And yeah. also, um, if they, if she did go home, um, they, you know, it can the, uh, you know, could the, the caregiver replace the alcoholic beverages with non-alcoholic beverages and just you put them into a, um, a the alcoholic containers. Um, I know a lot of people have been doing that unless she's really savvy and, and can um, taste the difference, um, uh, you know, which of course they don't mm -hmm. taste that great, but um, sometimes, you know, you can't tell the difference um, if you're, well, sometimes you, of course you can, but <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Erica. Um, yeah. So just that it wouldn't really be safe in this instance, given the concerns raised by her and the lack of any plan from APS to send her home. And Sylvia, did you have a comment? Or yeah. a um, regarding the suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. um, I would say, um, and, and I've seen it happen, unfortunately, to only start an antidepressant if the person can be monitored by somebody we trust. Mm -hmm. Because the first two weeks after you start an antidepressant in somebody who has active suicidal you know, thoughts, even not a plan, um, the rate of suicide goes up because it's an activating drug. Yeah. And to make one change at a time, but the person should be monitored by people we trust because the first two weeks, sometimes even the first few days are the times that people actually commit suicide, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just not give it and let her go. You know, she if we give it, she has to be watched. Um, yeah, that's the really hard part with the medication is that she is not, you know, um, I'd, I I. An antidepressant seems like it could be helpful here, but then there's that huge risk that because she just made these statements and it's possible, it's just a lot of risk without, I'm not even sure of exactly how much benefit I can expect from it. So it's a real hard decision. Yeah, yeah I think eventually it could help. It just takes, you know, three months sometimes to see an effect and before they feel better, they may feel worse. Mm -hmm. um, and back to the caregiver question, I would document any unusual marks, scars, bruises, um, anything that looks unusual um, that cannot be explained that can help your case too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, and it's a really good point that you make that when people are in their nadir, um, it's off of, of depression, it's often when they start to have that feel feel better whether it's with an antidepressant or for whatever reason and then looking back on the nadir in that time frame that is the greatest risk so thanks for pointing that out um and the importance of oversight so really careful uh, monitoring in that time frame carrie do you want to unmute yourself and or do you want me to read this what would be easier? yeah i mean i think the big question you know i think we're all agreeing knowing what we do is that you probably shouldn't go home with this caregiver right now um unless major things change and if she declined and um, getting her a higher level of care may or may not be possible but if there is a higher level of type of dementia care and she declines then you need to start this very long-ish mm -hmm. process of uh, and APS is usually involved in the case of like self-neglect if she's sort of not able to go home by herself but wants to go home by herself it's a little complicated but you need to start the process of capacity assessment, APS, and then this sort of decision about least restrictive option, most restrictive being guardianship, and that may end up being what she needs. Um, but getting a capacity assessment done at a facility is not always um, super easy, although APS sometimes has some ways to do that. Oh, interesting. So would... Uh... Would doing an APS report um, based on her statements that, that she doesn't trust her care? I mean, like, I don't want to you know, besmirch the caregiver because actually I do believe that 
like that's why I specifically wrote out, but she her grievances were not alarming at all. But um, the reason I, if I were to do a APS report and request for them to call me, and then maybe they could even start some wheels of motion about capacity in the meantime, I've never asked them to do that. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, then we'll need to be able to get in to get an assessment done um, in terms of what they think is happening. Um, and then, um, yeah, some of it will have to do with whether, like, maybe you look for dementia care and you find dementia care and she goes to dementia care and all is good. Mm -hmm. But if you get to a situation where you're unable to discharge her and she is uh, declining slash refusing, refusing options are available to her, then that may be uh, one avenue to get more support uh, along the pathway towards a potential uh, guardian. Yeah, yeah. The goal would be to like get the daughter and the, the daughter involved is the is the first goal, and she'll step up to do that. Or if there's someone here locally that's able to, because I think that there's a niece that's here locally. Mm. So if that person is willing to get involved, yeah. Was because she has a computer on her. Oh, okay, okay. Um. So, so if the daughter does get involved and wants placement and the patient says, well, I don't want to go, is it still appropriate to say we've got placement and we've got a place that's safe for you to go? And I mean, give, I mean, do we need, and do we, what, what kind of, you know. The daughter has medical power of attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvia, did you want to? Oh, your... yeah, I would just say, or find another caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, or find another event. caregiver. That, yeah. That's true. But that's not easy, you know, either. Um, but I would say that would be the other alternative, depending on how much help she needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's see. Um, any other ideas to increase participation? I mean, it's. I think it's her daughter even prepared me to say that she's going to make, she said to, she's going to make everyone's life miserable. And I don't feel like she's done as badly. I mean, she's not doing that, but I really want to have her participating. I don't want her to decline while she's in rehab. I'd like her to get walking, get more mobile. Um, so my thoughts are, you know, addressing pain, even though she keeps denying pain to me, she's asked, uh, she's told her caregiver and she's told her friend that she's having pain. So I'm thinking of scheduling her pain medication as a way to kind of anticipate and help her participate. Yeah. Any other suggestions on just helping her participate or giving her time or like the antidepressant thought is still there, but. Yeah. I mean, we, so we have a just about one minute. I think what you said, one thought that um, comes to mind and I don't, you probably have tried this, but you know, she, it sounds like has been a an active person her whole life mm -hmm. is that correct yes and so if you know so it's clearly has salience or had salience for her and so I guess really trying to um connect the engagement in a way that you know is appealing to her oh. that yeah whether you could do like a little snack of exercise with her or get her to lead something, you know, if you could get her in that role, some people will like it if they can share with you the type of exercises that they've done in the past, you know, those types of things or in a social milieu, just trying to be sort of as, as I'm sure you're doing, but using what you know about her and what drives her to um, connect into health behaviors that would help her feel better and stay well as possible you know understanding that she's in a safe place has a poa that can help navigate whether it's a caregiver or even another you know community supported living mm -hmm. given her dementia but we may we look forward to some updates and maybe we can talk further about her um if not our next time then you know that we can we can coordinate when we can 
hear an update and speak again. I think November 17th would be a kind of good time frame. She's, I anticipate her to still be in the facility and uh, okay. and we will definitely have had a care conference oh. and no okay. more. Yeah. Okay. That would be great, I think. Does anybody have any last ideas before we come to a close? Thank you all for staying on another couple of moments. We've covered a lot of ground. And thank you, Julie, for bringing this case for this um this care challenge forward. <laughs>